um, dual center, dual campus link up. Um, I think it all started going wrong on Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, but no, here we are, and thank you all for pitching out in rather horrid weather. Um, and thank you all in Exeter for pitching out in this weather. Um, I'm really very grateful to Zena in Exeter, um, Zena Wood. Um, she has a presentation for us. I'm very grateful to Pete Yeomans for being here as well, because he's going to say something in a minute. <laughs> Uh, I'm very grateful to Gordon for coming along since he's got something to share with us. So, um, what I suggest is that perhaps we ask Zena to, to give her presentation. Um, okay. And then, uh, after that, perhaps we ask uh, Peter and, and Gordon to share something with us, and then perhaps we can uh, try and have a discussion. Um, if anyone would like to tweet, if anyone is on Twitter, um, I'd like to propose the hashtag BCSSW. We'll go for that. So over to you, Zena, and I'll try and keep up with you on the slides. If I go to the actual raw end of the deal, really, because um, Steve obviously has um, research interest and um, very good at his research in the learning, uh, use of computing and IT in learning. Yes, I'm a computing science, computer science teaching fellow, and I've been lecturing for the last six years in the subject. But I'm afraid that is not my research area. I'm an applied ontologist and studying the technical research. However, I have um, my compassion is outreach, um, and I've been going to schools for the last six years. So hopefully, I'll try and give you some idea of what we possibly can do in a learning environment, and then I was going to speak about what we do in our outreach. So, hopefully, relevant and not too off target. So I've already said so for the last six years I've been a teaching fellow uh, in computer science lecturing on numerous uh, topics, so low level programming, high level programming, uh, personal logic, flight ontology, spatial and temporal reasoning, team projects, databases, like any teacher you can play quite a broad range really. Um, I also program in one of the degrees we offer, which is an RCMP degree, it's uh, basically computing and business. But it's coordinated by eSkills, the IT Skills Council, and it's uh, designed with 13 universities and over 60 employers. Um, like I said, I've coordinated the computer science out since 2007. Um, but I'm also now the College One participation and um, our coordinator. So our college provides engineering, maths, uh, physics, and all schools of modern and Science. So quite a broad range really, and so I coordinate uh, the wider participation and outreach activities we offer in those disciplines. So a bit about what I'm going to talk, so first, place be on target, a bit about some of the technology we could use um, in learning, and the two I want to focus on are chatbots, and something like the clickers, that's not the official term, but I think the best represents what we do. Um, I want to give you a little um, overview of the computer science we take into schools and the outreach activities we offer, and I want to end with a warning. I'll leave that to the imagination until we get there. So first of all, I thought we'll come to discuss, I suppose, how we can use uh, computing and ICT in schools. Like a true computer scientist, I do like to keep the two terms different um, and separate. So first of all, Something I'm very interested in is chatbots. Our oh, chatbots, sorry. So these are computer programs that aim to maintain a conversation with you. Um, they're great fun. They've been around since 1960s when Eliza first came out, but they're constantly advancing. Uh, but they have lots of application in learning. They're not just a fun tool for us to use. So they can be great as language systems. So I work with a local developer. Catherine Dorlich, uh, Rolo Carpenter, um, who's got the best chatbot prize in the Logan Prize contest up to five times in the money. So they're very good chatbots, they're not the best, so we held the Logan Prize contest here last month. No one won, that's not bad, but I'm happy. Um, but there's some great uses, and you've got some great ideas. So we have this idea of language, so the best way to learn a language is to immerse in the subject, immerse in that environment, 
the empty practice. Often in school, we can't have that ability. A teacher can't sit down and have a pupil for an hour each and have that same conversation. It would be a great resource, but we have time to do Chatbots can be trained in speech language. Um, you could mix it with a 3D um, and virtual reality of actual emergent development environment, but I think we're a long way from that. But chatbots have been used as language tutors, so um, students can actually sit down with the chatbot. There's no time constraints, and the chatbot's never going to disappear um, and learn the language. Um, and it has been successfully used to teach Russian students in the um, and a lot of other subjects. So I think they're a key tool for languages. We also have some assistant lecturers. Um, maybe you're not thinking you'd rather have one now. Um, but the University of Auckland, um, a couple in Australia, um, and some in Europe have started using chatbot as assistant lecturers um, and assistant tutors. So they can be subject specific. So maybe they'll give a lecture for you. Um, I have used one for presentations to me before, it's a bit of a different way to interact. But more importantly, the student can sit and ask questions to the chatbot. And with the ones we're working with, with the late developer, that they learn with each conversation they have. So unless they've been exposed to this subject, they won't bring it in. So it's very different to some of the others. Uh, you could program them to be more uh, complete, but if you want a certain answer, they will give that answer. Uh, so they have been used for language assistants and assistant lecturers. Subject specific tutors, so you could put them to the specific domain, maybe a certain amount of use of writing to um, and they will tutor on that. Um, but also confidence builders are quite key, so with anything, the student wants to learn but doesn't want to be, maybe think that a question is too silly or embarrassed to ask in front of students with co-workers. So they're really great confidence builders. Okay? A chatbot is not going to be, um, show any emotion really as that the student might be afraid of. So I've got some examples here. Um, you can't see the pointing, I don't think. So if you, the top one where we've got robot, robotposting.com. Um, if you go to that website, they are the ones that built all these assistant lectures and they're the ones that are being used. But the people often in the UPD share, you can have a lady is a specific subject tutor at an Australian university. The one blue teacher is the assistant lecturer in Auckland. In the middle, we have Joe. So this is a local uh, company, a company where they park and stuff, uh, based in Dorling. Uh, Joe is very descriptive. Maybe, um, you can be starting from coffee shops, etc. But she can be programmed for certain subjects and she give certain answers. It can be very useful in learning. And I mean, my George is my favourite at the top, but it's a little scary. Um, he can talk about anything to be based in a chat room, but he has to use as a language tutor. So I do think they are quite powerful tools that we could start to use. Um, the other ICT aspect uh, we use is enable students to interact with the topic so they can vote, answer questions. Um, they look so um, dated, I have to say, but I'm quite on this. Uh, and this is by a company called Turning Point, uh, so you can get students to uh, vote. Again, it's anonymous, so they don't feel embarrassed. And this starts to use technology to interact a bit more. Um, I want to <coughs> Outreach that we do, so the computer science we take into school, mainly because that's what I'm in the um, and that's what I initially put through for. So <laughs> I apologise if it's not what you expected. So, five, six years ago, we realised that there was a drop in computer science numbers, and it's quite clear, um, especially to me, that the problem lies in school. So, there was a misconception what computer science was. ICT, computer science very different and it's very different from your environment in school. So um, I started a programme of going into schools. Um, originally we piloted, or I piloted, with a group of 16 year old girls. So we started off with a slightly more difficult challenge. Um, but now we um, have a wide variety of schools across the south. Uh, we can do up to 200 students in a day. Um, 
and next year I can break and say it's going to India, so I'm quite excited. Uh, so what do we actually do? So we have a variety in our workshops, lectures and conferences uh, which allows the students to interact and show off. And the whole idea of this is to show what computer science is. Okay. Um, so we have workshops on how machines learn. So we um, take in uh, games like Reusis to have this concept of learning, business dilemma. Talking to chatbots, so we're taking Eliza, we're taking George, we're taking Joan, so they can have conversations with them. They actually develop their own Turing test, um, and we facilitate the ability for students to have their own Turing test with these machines. So they play the role of the judge, um, and get to test it on one of these chatbots. We have a range of the same lectures, they're not what we traditionally give our students, I suppose they are more interactive. So we have things like a whistle stop tour of AI where we show some of the latest computing and technology that can be used. Um, and then conferences, so we get them in. Uh, we have a programming one, so we play something called RoboCode that originated in IBM, so we get them blowing up tanks. The teachers take part to and say, please, PhD students get involved. And they have to uh, program the um, tank to behave in certain situations. So what does it do if it hits the wall, if it gets hit by a bullet, sees a tank? They can be very simple. So it's all in jar, we teach it from scratch, and we get a comp test going up within two hours. And they're actually quite good at it. I mean, they like trying to blow each other up with it, especially the teachers, I have to say. Um, but it, it's quite good because it teaches them concepts of machine learning, strategy, um, lots of different environments there. So what technology do I use? Well, I use chatbots a lot. Um, the students really like them, they can interact well with them. Uh, we get some very interesting conversations, I have to say. They soon start referring to the chatbots as either she or he, assigning motion, which is quite nice. Uh, we do use programming, and we do teach them programming. And we, the key thing about our outreach is we focus on our research. That's what we do, that's what we know. We, we're very passionate about our research, like any academic, I suppose, um, and what computer science is all about. So that's what our focus is. Now, I have to say, we don't have to use a computer for most of it because there's so many stereotypes about what computer science is. Uh, we don't necessarily sit behind a computer all the time. So our uh, how to machines learn actually doesn't use a computer at all. We use card games, we get the students involved, they play a computer really. Uh, searching and sourcing, we use the students. Um, we always know they're in schools. It's mainly the chatbots and the program I use the computer. Now my warning, um, you may not like this given the topic now. Something I wanted to say, so a lot of people just put computing and ICT facilities in their lectures, in their schools and say, well, they're assisting the learning. Well, often they're not. And I have to say, I think it has to be thought very carefully about how you're using it and what it captures there. So what is the aim? Is it assisting the learning? Or is it just there because it's a fun thing to use? Which fun could um, help learning, but not it's not a necessity, so um, that's probably my warning. Um, and that's where I end, really, um, on a contradiction to the event. Thank you very much, Sina. Um, are there any questions from the Exeter end? I don't know who you can see, because we've lost our camera, but... Not there for the thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no questions from Exeter? I've come in silence there. Okay. Are, are there any questions from Plymouth? Yeah. How long did it take? To, how, how did these chatbots learn? How, how, how long did it take to develop a chatbot? And then, if they wanted to do a chatbot, say, for example, about sexual health, how long would how how, how much work is involved in developing and teaching it that knowledge? Were you able to hear that, Zena? Uh, uh, heard, we heard bits of it. I heard how the chatbots learn. Was yeah. there an extension to the chat? So how long does it take for chatbots to learn? Yeah. That's, the, it, really, yeah. that's it, really. Yeah. Okay, so it depends what message you use. So if you look at some of the traditional based ones, such as Eliza or Alice, um, 
they're very much their program, they're very program, so they look for keywords and turn it into a response. Okay, so if you go back to the original chatbot, which is a line burst like either now, um, it will look for keywords and turn it into a question. And you can do that very much with Joan as well. So that's a case of um, basically sitting down and programming possible questions and the possible responses, which takes a while, shall we say. If you compare that with some of the ones that come from Maria Carpenter, so things like George and Joan, they're learning with each conversation they have. So if you want them to be subject specific or a tutor, then you make sure you only talk to them about a certain subject and make sure your responses are correct. So if you, you can easily go and have a conversation with George and Joan by going to jabberwocky.co.uk. Um, they've been based in the chat room for the last 20, uh, 10 to 20 years on them because they're based on older versions. They're not subject specific, shall we say. George will propose to you at the first 10 minutes. Um, but with languages, it's not too bad because if you're trying to get them to learn a different, a foreign language, as long as you can sit down and talk to them, they're learning with each conversation they have. Um, and George and Joan will pick up a language after that two or three conversations. So they do speak French. Um, some of my school ch uh, children try German. They try golf if you do, and worryingly they do that too. Wow, okay. But you do have to be careful because they're learning with each conversation you have. So some of the school children do try and be slightly um, irritating to them. Of course, yeah, George and Joan are learning that, so they're going to repeat that. They are censored, so they don't swear. Um, but yeah, like I say, they will propose and things like that. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Can I follow it up? I mean, so, so, so I mean, does that mean that, that you know, ignorant people like me can get access to a, a chatbot, Jabberwocky or something, on 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 the web and start teaching it something? Were you able to catch that? Not really. Okay. So, um, is it possible for lay people to get hold of something like Jabberwocky and start to teach it something? Yeah. Okay. Rolo is stuff, so Rolo is the key developer in his name, um, and he uh, does make available blank chatbots, so you can start your own chatbot, and it's quite free catchy, because the way they learn, the more you speak to them, uh, they become like you. Um, so, yes, which is quite freaky to be fair. Um, I'm not saying they're not perfect, some of these at the moment, and we do have a long way to go, but they, they can be used for language assistance, and um, to a degree subject specific. If you want something, if you want certain answers, if you want a specific question formulated in a specific way, you can, you'll have to hard program that. So say, I want this response from this question. And you can do that with uh, Jabberwacky as well as just talking to them. I was a lecturer in primary education uh, and I have an interest in uh, working with uh, the students here at Plymouth to see how chaotic we can make their learning um, and how much we can subvert what is perceived as good teaching and learning and actually make people learn stuff for themselves instead of relying on us to teach them stuff. So, blogs. Dot. Plim. Uni. Primary. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, just to echo the point, that you, the warning that you made. I think there's a there's a there's a, there's a, a significant risk that we all play, uh, that, that we all take in, in teaching and learning. That the tail wags the dog. That we find a, a shiny toy, and then figure out how we're going to make it fit teaching and learning. And that's actually the wrong way round. We need to look at what helps people learn the best and then find the right tools for the job. Um, and if you want to, if you want to, I'm, I'm not going to show this because it will be too complicated, but a student of mine uh, took the analogy of, uh, we've seen Monty Python, uh, the meaning of life and the machines that go bing. Yeah, that is a 
common perception of how educators look at technology. The more bells, the more missiles, the whistles, the more pings it does, the better it must be. And actually often it's the other way around. At the end of the day, teaching and learning is actually about good conversations, that's it. And so long as you're facilitating those conversations, whether it's through technology or face to face, that's how people learn. And what we're doing is trying to engage the trainee teachers in conversations wherever we can. So we're encouraging them to blog as much as we can about what they're learning uh, on the course. And we've created a, a essentially a framework that, that, that aggregates the blogs that the students make. Now these blogs aren't um, they aren't private. They're not inside the VLE. They are their blogs that they are writing as they see fit, when they see fit, and they are using Twitter to market them so that they get feedback from uh, people around the world. Uh, so if you if you scroll down a little bit on that site, uh, you can see here are the blogs that they they've been putting up, um, and what happens? Um, if, can you just click on the uh, one of these curvy ones? Because I'll talk about Just click on the, on the hyperlink on the word Kodo, which should take us to Kodo Experiment. Lovely. Yeah. It launches straight to their blog, so all it does is aggregate them, so that people have got one place that they can go to find these things, and we can find them, the students register these. Um, and then they, they, they write about what they do, and you can see they, they're getting views and they're getting feedback from, from people around the world. I have no idea if there's any feedback on that one in particular. Um, but what we're finding is that the students are uh, not relying on us necessarily for their learning. They're actually uh, they're actually gathering feedback from 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 other places. So uh, I, as is my wont, I, I set them a problem uh, about eight weeks ago, which was that um, there was no point in having a VLE, a virtual learning environment. They were entirely pointless um, commercial enterprises, uh, essentially set up to extract money from the education system with no real thought as to what learning is about. Uh, and that you could create a perfectly helpful, sensible one on your own in Google without paying anybody anything and without actually spending a huge amount of time on it. Uh, and then ran out of the room because I have no idea how to do it. Uh, when I arrived the next week, they had contacted two um, Google certified teachers who are experts in that field in primary education and they had, um, they, they were on Skype conversations with them and, and they asked me to leave. So I kind of thought I'd probably done my job at that point. And then the week later, they then reported on their thing. And somewhere in that blogging list, you can find their blogs on how to create a, a, a learning environment in Google that can do many of the key, key features and things that you need. Uh, so that's that one. I just remind myself what else I constructed on my phone. Printing systems. What an entirely pointless waste of money they are. Um, these are far better. Um, for £50, well, no it's not even that now, for £20 you can buy yourself a little uh, 3G dongle that has a telephone number with it. So you can empower everybody in a room to text you straight away. You don't need any complicated voting systems, you don't need to set any questions up or any things and think about how you're going to get really sophisticated questions where people can answer one to five or something. You can, you can just say text me what you think about whatever, here's the number and it costs 25 quid, you don't need anything complicated. There's another thing called text wall, which allows um, the same thing to be done uh, on, on, a, on a PC, it's much easier to manage and you get the texts coming into the, to the whole screen in, in, a, in an, easier, an easier vehicle. That's 15 pounds a year to rent for the number and your, and your kid number. Um, it's upset, isn't it? So we, uh, so yes, voting systems, Waste of money, to be honest. We've got a nice Promethean set that costs £1,800 that mimic a mobile phone. And then the logistics of handing those out at the start of the session and getting students clued into them and turned on to them when they've got one of those is, is entirely pointless. And everybody in our year groups that we have now has a mobile phone that can text. Not everybody has a smartphone that can tweet, but they all, without exception, can tweet, can text a question if they have a question. And then the impact of that is that in a large, what we are trying to facilitate in a large lecture of 200 people is uh, formative feedback in the middle of it. So we're planning pauses where we might play a, a short film or something so that we can look at the texts that we're getting 
and respond to any misconceptions that the students have and pick up and sometimes they get a personal response back to their phone sometimes we respond to the whole group because there's a clear misconception amongst the group and that's incredibly powerful and it's dead easy and it isn't complicated technology it's the dog wagging the tail not the tail wagging the dog and we're not paying anybody large sums of money in the education industry which is always a good thing as far as I'm concerned um, Cozy systems, class blogs. We we are also uh, again my, my field is, is education. We're getting um, students to respond to class blogs and children's blogs. Are you aware of how many schools and children are blogging their work rather than writing their work? I'm going to show you. Um, we need to Google this time or Bing, whichever other search engines exist, for Heathfield CPS. Uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Could I get you to move slightly closer to the camera? <laughs> How's that? Any better? Ja Janet just texted to say she couldn't quite hear you. Ah. That's no great problem, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> My wife says it's better that way. Um, yeah, what we need to do is just, uh, if you can go to the, the one that says he feels he has blogs. It's a smart screen. Yeah, not not because he's on his. Oh, he's on his That's okay. It's, 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 no, we're back on the PC now. Are we? We can't even That'll do. You working? So each each year group at this school is is blogging their things. That one's a particularly small one, not the one I wanted because we're on Bing. I need to get to. Excuse me a second. Um, this is. Hello again, this is David, David Mitchell's blog, uh, which is part of the Heathfield Community Primary School. Uh, every, every class has a blog which they use to some degree or another. He had uh, a group of year fives last year who, uh, in his words, were a basket case. They were, they, were going, they, were, they were not going to hit anywhere near the numbers that the government wanted them to hit. So he started blogging with them because there was nothing else left, in his words. And so they, they then began to blog everything that they, that they did, all of their work they put online, they got feedback, uh, principally from a fabulous lady called Julia, Julia Skinner, who lives in Gloucestershire, and this is in Bolton. And she started encouraging the children to write more and simply encourage. She didn't criticise anything. Uh, by the end of that, in 18 months, those children went from 9% of them being predicted to get a level 5 in English, which is shocking, to be honest, to 65% or so getting a level 5 in English. And David maintains that simply because of the audience and the power of the audience in encouraging the children to buy more and the raised stakes of doing it in public. But the schools all around the country doing this and they need audience. So as a challenge for you all over, over Christmas, adopt a school and start commenting on some children's blogs because they're everywhere. If you, if you look at Twitter, um, and look at UK Ed Chat, the hashtag UK Ed Chat, or comments for kids. You'll see dozens of requests from class teachers saying, please will you comment on, on my blog? Um, and it's a very powerful thing and something really, really important. Um, Julia Skinner has, has now started something else called the 100 Word Challenge, where she's asking children to leave 100 word stories on her blog. And she has something like 200 entries a week from children around the country um, just trying out story writing in 100 words with a different stimulus each week. Uh, and our students in Plymouth now are supporting her in responding to all of the children's blogs because there's it's too many for her to do now. Um, so that's a very powerful thing. And I think I've got one other thing. Oh, games development. Uh, if if um, the blog that I showed you earlier was uh, from something called Kodu, which is a Microsoft uh, free, it's still in beta form, but you can, you, if you Google for Kodu, K-O-D-U. Can you Google for Kodu, please? I've got a fabulous assistant. It's very obedient. Um, Kodu, and there's the top link, um, is free, and it's, um, Technically, I, I have no idea what, what it's written in or how it works, but I know that if you download it to your computer and then give it to a child, they can do incredible things. Um, we tried this with some year five children, so they are nine, going on ten, and if you just scroll down so you can see the screenshot, they were able to design a world 
where the little Kodu robot can fly around and do stuff and bump into trees and speak and then shoot things and collect coins and whatever else. So they designed the world and they designed how Kodu should react and respond within the world. Um, the first week we showed, the students showed the children how to do it and the children replicated the world that they've been shown how to make. Um, the, the week after, we, we approached it from a completely different way, and we showed the children the controls, and then asked them to fiddle about with the bits and pieces that were within it, and see what they could make it do, and then make a game. And the games were magnificent, and entirely diverse. So this was, this was the second week. The third week, I smiled at the students and said, right, we're going to see if we can do it with seven-year-olds now. And we went to a, a local school just inside the city. And uh, again, they made incredible things. And those seven-year-olds were able to use this package that was conceived by Microsoft as a, as a year eight, nine tool for games design. And they were able to, to create that and, and, and figure out that they can do all kinds of marvellous things. Got one last thing uh, they, on the robotics front that we've been doing, which is a site called Go Robo. Uh, some of you will be familiar with Robo Sapiens. Uh, you know, little black and white robots. Uh, Go Robo is a piece of software that was designed to complement that and in a computerist language that I have no idea about, uh, you can see it here, it, it allows people to write code to control the Robo Sapien. And we had, I've got one particularly talented student who led, as it went, two autistic um, spectrum children, high functioning autistic boys, uh, created a dance sequence for this, wrote a piece of dance music to go with it, filmed it, and bundled it all together and put it, could have put it onto YouTube, but of course, schools can't use YouTube because it's full of pedophiles. So, um, that, we couldn't have been able to do that, but we did do, nevertheless, the rest of it, and then they celebrated the film in the classroom, which is a real shame, because it could have been, it probably would have had, I don't know, thousands of hits by now, and huge compliments but we can't do that in schools. Uh, and I'll finish with a warning, which is um, uh, something about the perceptions of e-safety in schools. Um, uh, and the logic and the stupidity that we teach young children now. Um, you, are, you are unknown to my child. My, my son, who's five, none of you know him. You are all strangers and therefore dangerous. That is what we're teaching children. And that the only stuff that's on the internet is bad. That is, that is the net effect of all of the e-safety agenda that we are, we are perpetuating in schools. Or at least that's how schools are interpreting it. Um, you mustn't use the internet because you might, you might encounter a, a pervert. And it's, it's just bonkers. So that's the end of my rant, uh, which is completely unscripted. And my apologies for uh, any offence I may have caused, which is usually wide and varied. Uh, but there we go. Brilliant. Thank you. More storm silence. <laughs> 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 Nobody else asked questions. <laughs> <laughs> questions again, aren't you? Any person asking questions around here? Can I can I take the, the you you said that um, all your primary school or all your primary school kids have phones and you not primary tech. school kids. My trainee teachers. So ah, these are sorry. Ah, ah, sorry, sorry. There is one school in Plymouth that does allow their children to take phones in, right. and that's saltash.net community yeah. school. Uh, you can find the, the deputy head teacher, a very talented man, who goes by the name of Chicken Saltash on Twitter. Um, he, yeah, he has a difficult not difficulty with chickens, he's very fond of them. Too fond, some would say. And he, he does dress as a chicken very regularly, for reasons that I he's never convinced me about. Um, and, and they, they don't have any issues with cyberbullying because all the children use Facebook as a tool to contact teachers, so it's the daylight. And they don't have any issues with happy slapping or children misusing phones in school because they're just normal. Um, and it's a very, very interesting case study what they've been able to achieve there. Including renaming the school with a dubious name. Is what children wanted about them. Uh, Is that what okay? <laughs> no. They wanted to call it saltash.com, but the guy who had bought the name right. would not sell it to them unless they gave him an absolute fortune. Really? Yeah. Okay. .net's more ethical. 
Essentially, for, for, for each of us, 10 minutes a day can make a significant difference to a young child's life in terms of their motivation to write and therefore their ability to write. Um, but also, there's another layer of this. There are, there are young people learning to be teachers who need challenge and want challenge and are trying to say what it is they think and need people to be commenting back at them so that they can moderate their views or, or follow direction that I should be taken. So if any of you do have time to find one and pay a bit of attention, it's, it's an important thing. Have you um, had any up at Yammer? Have you have at Yammer? Or, or Yammer? Yeah. No. Uh, okay, because we started using it in business, but um, basically um, it looks like, like Facebook, yeah. but it's yeah. basically secured Facebook, you have your own area, mm. so you can actually make it available to whoever you want. You can start your own discussions, your groups, all the things that you would do on, on Facebook. Right. And it's, um, it seems to be taken off in the business world, well, in the software development world, which I'm in. Seems to be rather, rather than getting your own SharePoint spaces up and all this sort of stuff, and all the VLE stuff, the yeah, Amazon seems to be hitting that. Hitting that. I just wanted to do was using education. So no, I've not heard of that one. We're trying to break away from using stuff that is closed. It's, it's not it's not a closed site. Anybody can use it. You don't have to pay for it. It's yeah. not it's almost like Facebook, but it's and, and I don't know how they make the money out of it, but it's all there and mm -hmm. you can then take it to the next stage if you want to, you know. So mm -hmm. we, we, we just start off that with collaboration, collaboration across the world. Mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is always a nightmare for most organisations. Yeah. And I suppose that's the same in teaching, isn't it? It's the, that collaboration. Yeah, there's a, there's a very, very large and powerful network of educators use, that use Twitter in that manner. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the hashtag UK Ed Chat, you'll see on third, is it, what day is it? Thursday. Thursday. Now, Saturdays, they're, um, they're all discussing something for an hour between eight and nine to do with education and they all congregate and, and meet and, 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 and talk using the UK hashtag. So it's there's some remarkable stuff going on. And that's how my students advertise their blogs, that's how they get feedback, and that's how they find people that have got expertise that doesn't exist in me, which is most stuff to be honest. I just poke them they just figure the rest out for themselves. I'm not quite sure, but I think I've seen them, might have a question. Um, the quite a question, sorry, we've had a bit of difficulty hearing um, some parts. I apologise if this is a Um But I don't know if you've heard of stuff, so I was talking about Alice or Chatbox, programming language, but schools can also use Alice, um, which is kind of a, a slightly similar to your game that it's from movies, and there's also something called Scratch. Yes. Um, Manchester University run a national competition for Scratch, um, which schools can take part in, um, and eventually we'll be doing one in Robot next year. But you can use Scratch and um, Alex, which are tools that are popular, and also with your robots. Um, so if any school has a Lego Mindstorm, they have the same interface. So you can use Flowcharts to program them. But then you can also start getting more complicated and show them what programming language is making those play charts and progress that way. 
Yeah, we have this, the same group of students took Lego Mind Stores in as well. We had the three activities kind of going on. Um, and it was quite interesting to look at the way that the children responded to them. They were far more interested in Kodu than they were in Mind Storms, and they were far more interested in the Robo Sapien than they were in Mind Storms. Mind Storms was perceived as being a layer below. I think, I guess, because of the, the look of the robot rather than because of the, the, the code or anything like that. Um, I've, I've come near to Scratch, but it's always felt slightly distasteful, so I've run away from it, to be honest. Too computerist for me. Uh, I think that's why Mindstorms have never worked. You know, um, I've taken about 15 years ago trying to introduce kids to mind, or my own kids to mind storms, and uh, just not wanting to do that, and I was more interested in, and they were taking it forward is to integrate it. But I think something like the new stuff, I think would be much more really visual stuff. Would be much I, think, I think something that I heard that, that Steve Jobs said about the uh, about iPhones was what he was trying to do was to get a sense of delight. Yeah. You know, when you scroll down an iPhone and it bumps back, there is absolutely no good reason for it to do that. Other than when you do it, even after you've had one for years, it's so cool. <laughs> and what Kodu has managed to do is he's managed to create that same sense of delight. So when children use it, they are just delighted at the product. And my perception, although I haven't really dug into Scratch, is that it, you don't get the same sense of delight when you use it. <coughs> actually quite significant because if you bury something so deep that nobody ever knows about it, it's still worth nothing, isn't it? There's, there's a subtle balance in that. But for my students, what they need is feedback. They don't, the, the, the there, is, there is just isn't any IP. Um, uh, you could take um, David Mitchell as an example. His, the IP that he has in what he's done, his ability to understand how to get to children to blog is valuable. It's now three times as valuable because he's all over everywhere giving it away for free. 